Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we will present a new subject on pediatric surgery made easy. It is biliary atresia. Biliary atresia is very important for all pediatric surgeon and pediatrician. It is one of the most common causes of surgical jaundice in infancy. And all pediatric surgeon should be familiar with this disease. What is the etiology? How to diagnose? What is the clinical presentation? And how to manage? And what are the post-operative complications? And what about the prognosis? Let's start. So our objective today, by the end of this presentation, you should be able to know what is biliary atresia, what is the etiology, what is the classification of the biliary atresia, how to diagnose biliary atresia, and how to manage, and also the prognosis and post-operative complications. Biliary atresia is an obliterative disorder of the biliary tract affecting both intra- and extra-hepatic bile duct system. And if not treated, ultimately it will lead to liver failure and liver cirrhosis. So it is a fibroinflammatory disorder, affecting both intra- and extra-hepatic bile duct system. Regarding the embryology, of the bile duct. It's very important to know that the biliary system developed as a diverticulum from the foreground. This diverticulum appears at the fourth week of gestation and then it will develop in two parts. Part will form the common bile and the extrahepatic biliary system and this is called Pars cystica will give rise to the common bile and the cystic and the gallbladder, and this is the extrahepatic biliary system. And the second part is called pars hepatica, will give rise to and form the intrahepatic bile duct system. So there is a hepatoblast that differentiates into the hepatocyte and then intrahepatic biliary network. So this hepatic diverticulum will divide into part external will form the extrahepatic bile duct system and part will form the intrahepatic and it's called as a part cystica and part hepatica. And then the final step is the communication between the intra and the extrahepatic bile duct system occur at about the 12 week of gestation to transport the newly formed bile into the gallbladder and the duodenum. So, the question now, what is the etiology for biliary arteries? Why the baby born with obliterated biliary system, obstructed extrahepatic bile duct system. Unfortunately, the etiology is unknown. However, there are multiple theories trying to explain what happened. Is the pathology is one of the congenital anomalies? Is it genetic mutation? Or is it intrauterine or perinatal viral infection? Is it immune-mediated inflammation or exposure to toxin? Is it vascular or metabolic insult to the devouring biliary tree? So, actually, no single cause. And the disease is considered as a multiple entities, not single one. So, the pediatric surgeon, in order to explain the etiology, they classify the biliary atresia from clinical point of view into four clinical types. Biliary atresia may be classified clinically into syndromatic biliary atresia. We mean by syndromatic biliary atresia that 
there is a coexistence of the biliary atresia with certain syndromes or other anomalies, vascular, visceral anomalies, or uh, other anomalies. So the pediatric surgeon classify these as a syndromatic. Number two, cystic biliary atresia. There is a cystic dilatation at the site of the obstructed biliary tree. Number three, maybe cytomegaloviral biliary atresia. They have identified some infant with positive serology, denoting that there is high immunoglobulin against cytomegalovirus. So they classify this type as a cytomegaloviral biliary atresia. And finally, and unfortunately, the largest clinical group is an isolated or unspecified biliary atresia. No other defining characteristic, no associated anomalies, no viral infection, no cystic dilatation. Only there is a fraction of the biliary tree. There is obstructions of the extrahepatic biliary duct. So this is isolated. The pediatric surgeon by this classification, they noticed that in each group, there is maybe homogeneity. There is maybe clinical similarity. And they suppose that certain etiology may arise within each group. So these four clinical groups trying to explain the etiology of the biliary atresia. As etiology is not single cause. Let's see in a syndromatic biliary atresia, the biliary atresia recognized as a key features in two syndromes. Number one, biliary atresia splenic malformation syndrome. Association of the biliary atresia with polysplenia, asplenia, double spleen, situs inversus, with or without malrotation, preduodenal portal vein, absence of the intrahepatic vena cava or cardiac anomalies. And also the second syndrome is called cat eye syndrome, maybe cardiac anomalies or anorectal malformation. So the biliary atresia may be seen as a key component or coexisted with these two types of anomalies. So how might we explain the etiology of the biliary atresia in syndromatic biliary atresia? Pediatric surgeon suggests that it may be embryonic defect or congenital anomaly. Uh, there are multiple anomalies occurring together. Polysplenia, situs inversus, maybe malrotation associated with biliary atresia. So biliary atresia here may be due to congenital anomaly also may be due to genetic mutation. And some studies identified that may be linked with maternal diabetes and other first trimester insult as a use of the bronchodilators anti-inflammatory medication. First trimester, yes, because the pathology happened in association with other anomalies. Also abnormalities of the chromosome 22 is described for these cases. So this is the cause or the explanation for what syndromatic biliary atresia. Regarding cystic biliary atresia, what is meant by the cystic biliary atresia? It is extrahepatic cyst formation at the level of the obstructed biliary duct system. So this condition may be misdiagnosed as a congenital Cholidocal cyst, and the differentiation is very important. It can be with a cholangiogram, yes. Also, clinically, that the infant with biliary atresia will have jaundice, persistent jaundice, dark urine, and clay stool. However, some babies with cholidocal cyst may have may clear jaundice and may have a pigmented stool. So the differentiation is very important. So the question, how might we can explain the etiology of the biliary atresia in cystic biliary atresia? It may be ischemic insult affecting the distal extrahepatic duct with consequent proximal dilatation. 
So the pediatric surgeon suppose that this dilatation may be related to an ischemic insult. Also may be related to increased gene expression of hypoxia inducible factors or decrease vascular endothelial growth factors suggesting the reduced angiogenesis. So the etiology here is different from that of the syndromatic biliary atresia. Here, pediatric surgeons suppose that the cause of the biliary atresia may be related to ischemia, may be related to increased hypoxia-inducible factors or decrease in the vascular endothelial growth factor. The third type is a cytomegalovirus associated biliary atresia. The pediatric surgeon recognized that certain viruses may be associated with the development of the biliary atresia. Several viruses suggested to cause this problem, including uh, rheovirus, Epstein virus, however, the most common is cytomegalovirus. This virus can be detected in some cases of biliary atresia. So, how does this virus damage the biliary tract? How does this virus cause cholangiopathy to the bile duct? Is it direct affection of the virus to the biliary tract? May not be simple, cholangiocyte damage by the virus. However, this virus may trigger autoimmune process, and this is the most accepted theory. Triggering self-damage with activations of the pro-inflammatory immune system by the macrophage and natural killer cells, so the pathology in the biliary atresia is not damaged to the extrahepatic bile duct system only. However, also the intrahepatic bile duct may be damaged by this autoimmune process. And the pediatric surgeon cannot know who is the first. The pathology starts by the damage of the extrahepatic bile duct system, and the affection of the intrahepatic is a secondary phenomenon, or it is an autoimmune disease from the start, or it is a fiber inflammatory disease affecting both intra and extra. And finally, isolated biliary atresia. Unfortunately, this isolated biliary atresia is the largest clinical group, uh, bearing in about 80% uh, of cases. No defining characteristic, no known syndromes, no, no cystic dilatation, no virus detected. So this is called isolated or non-syndromatic biliary atresia, the most common. Maybe developmental problem, maybe related to the bile duct remodeling stage, maybe related to genetic, ischemic, environmental or other viral causes. However, no identifiable cause responsible for this type. This is an important question. What about the timing of the disease onset or when biliary atresia actually occur? Is it an intrauterine pathology? Is it developmental disorder, congenital anomaly, or is it prenatal process or acquired pathology? So regarding the syndromatic biliary atresia and cystic biliary atresia, it seems to be an intrauterine onset due to association with other anomalies, polysplenia, situs, malrotations, may be related to intrauterine or developmental problem. It seems to be clear. However, the problem is for the largest and clinically manifest in more than 80% of the children is isolated and some cases of the viral association. Actually, pediatric surgeons have a little evidence to explain this type. Is it developmental or intrauterine for the isolated biliary atresia, or is it an acquired form of anomaly? Very important question. So, initially for the isolated biliary atresia, 
it was considered as a perinatal in onset, with a period of normal pigmented stool and later jaundice. We mean that the baby born with patent bile duct. Then there is a process of inflammation, of obstructions, and then the baby developed jaundice and pale stool. This is, was felt or considered by the most pediatric surgeon. However, there are areas of new studies today. There is a study on what is called gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. This gamma glutamyl is secreted by the biliary epithelial cells, secreted and found very high in the amniotic fluid in the second trimester of gestation due to passage of the bile into the fetal intestine. However, its level normally drop or tail off during the third trimester due to contractions of the fetal anal sphincter or increase in the fetal anal sphincter too. In cases showing to be biliary atresia, this second trimester rise doesn't happen. And this suggests that this bile flow had already stopped. So, in association with ultrasound showing cool bladder anomalies or abnormalities, this may be considered as an uh, explanation that isolated biliary atresia may be an intrauterine problem or intrauterine pathology. So, the pediatric surgeon, this study is ongoing recently. Supposing that this gamma glutamyl transpeptidase secreted by the biliary epithelium normally present or increase in the second trimester and passing into the fetal intestine and then passing into the amniotic fluid. However, during the third trimester, there is marked decrease in this enzyme due to increase in the tone of the fetal anal sphincter. If this second trimester rise doesn't happen associated with ultrasound showing non-visualization of the gallbladder this could explain the presence of isolated biliary atresia that previously considered to be perinatal in onset so regarding the etiology of the biliary atresia it is not a straightforward etiology it is not a single entity disease it's a multiple entity. What about the etiology? Not known. Is it congenital anomalies? Developmental anomaly? Is it viral infection? Is it immune-mediated inflammation? Is it exposure to toxin? It's a dilemma where the injury, where or what time for injury to happen. Maybe genetic disorders or maybe injury in the first trimester. This explaining? biliary atresia splenic malformation syndrome, it's okay. Or is the injury occurring prenatal, around birth, shortly after birth, so to explain the isolated form and virally associated biliary atresia. So all these items working, however, no one with guarantee to explain what are the etiology for the development of the biliary atresia. However, what is fixed is, it is a fibroinflammatory or obliterative disorder affecting both intra and extra hepatic biliary duct system, where the, the pathology starting in the extra and the intrahepatic affected by secondary phenomena or start at all affecting both system, it is not well known. Now, what is the classification of the biliary atresia? We speak about clinical classification. Clinical classification, yes. Syndromatic biliary atresia, cystic biliary atresia, and cytomegaloviral associated biliary atresia, and isolated biliary atresia. Now we will classify biliary atresia according to the phenotype, according to the appearance, according to the anatomical or morphological characteristic or simply 
at the level of the bile duct obstruction. This classification depends on the level of the bile duct obstruction. Type 1, atresia of the common bile duct. Obstruction at the common bile duct. Type 2A, atresia of the common hepatic. Type 2B, atresia of the common bile, common hepatic, and the cystic. And finally, type 3, atresia of what? All extra hepatic bile duct system. And unfortunately, or badly, it is the most common one. Atresia of the all extra hepatic bile duct. Also, another classification, the pediatric surgeon at first classified the biliary atresia as correctable and non-correctable, depending on the patency of the extrahepatic bile duct. If there is a patent duct or a patent gallbladder, so we can make some kind of anastomosis with this patent part, this is previously termed as a correctable biliary atresia. After that, non-correctable. There is no extrahepatic. So correctable and non-correctable classification previously used to describe the, the, the morphological or anatomical types of classification. If there is a patent extrahepatic duct, distended gallbladder, present of mucus or bile in the gallbladder, so we can use this dilated bar for anastomosis or no. Now, what about the incidence of the biliary atresia? Incidence of the biliary atresia varies around the world. The overall is 4.47 per 1,000 live pairs with a slight female predominance and also syndromatic biliary atresia significantly less in China compared with the West. How to diagnose biliary atresia? Very important question. Why? Because we said at the start that biliary atresia, if untreated, ultimately will lead to liver cirrhosis and liver failure. So this will rise the importance of early diagnosis of biliary atresia. It's very critical to save the native liver to avoid the need for liver transplantation. So the pediatric surgeon should consider this item is very important. Prenatal diagnosis of the biliary atresia. Is it possible? Yes. Some researches are going on this. However, it's still difficult. How can we diagnose the biliary atresia prenatal? We speak about the gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, that the second trimester rise in the amniotic fluid and then the drop. And if this rise doesn't happen with non-visualization of the bil of the gallbladder, it may be seen to help in the diagnosis of the biliary atresia. However, it's difficult because you cannot differentiate between pathologically and physiologically low level of these digestive enzymes. So it's not an easy job for the prenatal diagnosis. However, we speak about the postnatal diagnosis and we will proceed with the first step is the screening of the before biliary atresia. We can screen infant for biliary atresia, like screening for the thyroid, hypothyroidism. So we screen for biliary atresia, trying to get an earlier diagnosis of the pathology, also by the clinical presentation, by the blood biochemistry imaging and liver biopsy and cholangiogram. We will speak about the screening it's used in Japan, Taiwan, and China to identify the infant at a possible risk for biliary atresia, and the early results are promising with earlier operations or surgical corrections for this infant. Also, we may have what's called laboratory-based direct bilirubin screening. We can screen infant by two stage. First stage at 16 hours after birth for detections of Elevation of the bilirubin in the direct fraction type. And then the second stage for the positive infant at the two weeks. So this is screening program based on the bilirubin level to identify infant with a possible risk for biliary atresia before they become symptomatic. 
Also, the clinical presentation of the biliary atresia. Biliary atresia usually present with a triad of symptoms. Number one is the jaundice. Jaundice that persists more than two weeks should no longer be considered physiological and should be investigated, indicated for investigation. And the elevation in the bilirubin in the biliary atresia is mainly in the conjugated type or direct type. Number two, dark urine, pale stool or clay colored stool. However, there may be sometimes meconium staining in some cases of biliary atresia, as we said that the, there is a debate about that it is a congenital anomaly developed intrauterine or perinatal. Also, there is maybe hepatosplenomegaly. So, the, by this clinical presentation, Pediatric surgeon may suspect that the case is biliary atresia and go to prorombit investigation. However, it's important to differentiate and know the differential diagnosis for other causes of conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. It's very important to know that there, is, uh, there are medical causes, yes, torsion infection, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, Algill syndrome, cystic fibrosis, and progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis. All these medical causes, the child may present with neonatal cholestasis, may present with elevation in the direct bilirubin or elevation in the conjugated bilirubin. And we put the key investigation in this slide to exclude these items before proceed for the surgical biliary atresia. And also there are other causes surgical point of view, colidocal malformation, and incipitated bile syndrome, spontaneous perforation of the bile duct, tumors, gallstones, all these surgical causes may be responsible for neonatal cholestasis or, or neonatal jaundice. It's very important for the pediatric surgeon to be familiar with these types and their investigation. Blood biochemistry, yes, serum bile acid levels may be increased in the cholestatic diseases. However, it cannot differentiate the biliary atresia from other diseases. Also, serum lipoprotein positive in all patients. Also, it also may be positive in the patient with neonatal hepatitis. So it's non-specific. Also, hyaluronic acid will consider as a serum marker for liver function also reported as a biochemical marker for evaluating patients with biliary atresia. Imaging studies is a very important. Hepatobiliary ultrasound. Hepatobiliary ultrasound should be performed on all jaundiced patients. It will exclude other surgical causes for jaundice, like the colidocal cyst, incipitated bile syndrome. It will answer the question, is there, if there is a dilatation of the intrahepatic bile duct system or collapse of the bile duct system, if there is gallbladder abnormalities or not. In biliary atresia, intrahepatic ducts are not dilated because they may be affected by the autoimmune process or by the inflammatory process. We said that the pathology in the biliary atresia may be related to autoimmune process affecting both intra and extra, so the intrahepatic bile duct will not be dilated in case of biliary atresia. The sonographic finding in the biliary atresia regarding gallbladder may be small, shrunk, and non-contractile. However, failure to visualize the gallbladder is not diagnostic for biliary atresia. Also, other anomalies as a polysplenia syndrome may be obvious during ultrasonic examination. There is a sign called triangular cord sign. In some cases, there is a well-defined triangular area of high density. These reflect, seen at the Borta hepatis, reflecting that these are the remnants of the duct, remnant of the bile duct, or thickened fibrotic remnant of the bile duct, called the triangular cord sign by the ultrasound. So the triangular cord sign and gallbladder abnormalities, absent or non-visualization, irregular wall, or other anomalies, this combination 
increase the accuracy or the diagnostic sensitivity of the ultrasound might reduce the need for the liver biopsy and hepatobiliary scintigraphy in babies with suspected uh, biliary atresia. Hepatobiliary scintigraphy, it's very important to differentiate the biliary atresia from other cholestatic disease. In biliary atresia, the uptake by the hepatocyte is rapid, but the excretion in the bowel is absent, even in the delayed imaging after 24 hours. So, hepatobiliary scintigraphy depends on the radioisotope material, like technetium, taken by the liver and then excreted into the gastrointestinal tract. In case the bile duct are patent, the tracer can be followed on the gastrointestinal tract. However, in biliary atresia, the uptake by the liver is normal. However, there is a delayed or absent excretion in the extrahepatic bile duct and the intestine due to obstructed or atretic extrahepatic bile duct system. In hepatocellular jaundice, uptake is delayed due to, by the liver due to parenchymal disease of the liver and intestinal secretion may be present or absent according to the case. Liver biopsy is very important to diagnose the biliary atresia, looking for the histological features of the portal tract edema, large duct obstruction, bile duct blagging, small cell infiltrate. This is very important that these characteristics are specific for biliary atresia, especially large duct obstructions, which is against the, that of the neonatal hepatitis. Currently, it is a diagnostic accuracy reaching about 85% of cases, and those cases not quite meeting the histological criteria, the cholangiography is required to, the diag to diagnose the case as a biliary atresia or not. Regarding what's called duodenal aspiration, in some cases it's very easy and non-invasive and rapid test to insert tube into the duodenum to search for uh, if there is a bilirubin stain, the fluid is aspirated, the case is not biliary atresia, and there is bile in the gastrointestinal tract. So to summarize, it's very important how to diagnose biliary atresia. Prenatal diagnosis or postnatal diagnosis? Yes, prenatal diagnosis is difficult. Amniotic fluid digestive enzymes as gamma glutamide transpeptide, as we speak about it. However, the difficulty arises from we cannot differentiate abnormally low and physiologically low. Also by the ultrasound, so there is a problem or difficulty regarding the prenatal diagnosis. However, research is ongoing to combine non-visualization of the gallbladder associated with the digestive in amniotic fluid enzymes abnormalities. Postnatal diagnosis, we will start with a screening, stool card, color card, and fractionated hemoglobin used in Japan, Taiwan, and it show promising result for early detection. Also fractionated or conjugated bilirubin is used in two stages. At first stage, at uh, 60 hours of life to identify uh, increased conjugated bilirubin and then followed at two weeks. By the clinical presentation, yes, triad of jaundice that possessed more than two weeks of dark urine, pale or clay stool, and hepatosplenomegaly. Investigation, hepatobiliary ultrasound, triangular cord sign, and gallbladder abnormalities, hepatobiliary scintigraphy, rapid uptake by the liver, and absent excretion. And also, some laboratory tests, however, it is non-specific. The liver biopsy is diagnostic in most cases with an accuracy reaching about 85%. Also, this is very important. Conjugated bilirubin with a dark urine and pale stool or cholestasis. How to think about the cholestasis in infancy it's very important to start with exclusion of the medical causes, as we said, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, torsion infection, cystic fibrosis. After that, we need to perform ultrasound. And the ultrasound will show 
whether non-dilated intrahepatic bile duct or dilated intrahepatic bile duct, with or without cyst. If we have non-dilated intrahepatic bile duct, we need to exclude biliary atresia by the liver biopsy. If the liver biopsy show clear large duct obstruction, portal tract edema, portal plugging, it's okay. If the appearance is unclear, in this case, we may perform ERCB, endoscopic retrograde cholangium and keratography, or repeat the biopsy, or perform isotope scan or repeat biopsy, to reach whether surgical cause excluded or confirmed. Regarding the dilated, if the ultrasound showing dilated intrahepatic bile duct, with or without cyst, in this case, we may need to perform MRCB or ERCB. Diagnosing cystic malformation, colidocal cyst, insipicated bile syndrome, or other causes as a stenosis. In these three cases, we ask about if the case is obstructed or not. If no, it will be subjected to elective surgery. If yes, it will need to emergent surgery with or without operative cholangiography. So this diagram or this scheme is very important for all pediatric surgeon and pediatrician regarding how to deal with neonatal cholestasis, how to deal with conjugated jaundice, dark urine and pelvis too. First, exclude medical causes by the key investigation, then perform ultrasound, whether non-dilated intrahepatic or dilated, and then you can proceed according to this finding that non-dilated biliary atresia suspicion is very high with dilated colidocal insipicated bile or mechanical block or other causes as a stenosis. And if the pathology or liver biopsy is unclear, you can repeat the pathology, performing RCB, isotope scan, to reach whether there is a surgical cause or not, and finally decide to go with emergency surgery with or without operative cholangiogram to confirm the diagnosis. Also regarding the dilated part, if there is a dilated intrahepatic, whether it's obstructed or not, yes or no, no for elective surgery and yes for emergency. Very important two schemes regarding the diagnosis of biliary atresia. Now, the question is very important. How to treat biliary atresia? Currently, the therapeutic approach for biliary atresia is almost entirely surgical. With aiming to restore the bile flow, clear the jaundice, preserve the native liver. It's very important. So researches are ongoing by doing this type of surgery, trying to avoid the damage of the or progressive liver damage. The second possibility is a liver transplantation. So whether to diagnose early the pathology and perform the surgical treatment, or if you are waiting or delayed case, you will not have uh, other option except liver transplantation. So we will start by short hint about history of the surgical treatment. In 1928, William Ladd described about 11 cases or series of 11 cases of surgical jaundice that he had operated upon. With restoration of the bile flow and clearance of the jaundice using conventional biliary anastomosis. Make an anastomosis between the remnant of the bile duct and the bowel. His results were remarkable, reporting about six out of the 11 cases draining bile. Also, not all his cases were truly biliary atresia. It may be colidocal cyst, maybe mechanical block, like insipicated bile syndrome. However, William Ladd, at the time, point for the start of the surgical treatment of biliary atresia. Who, uh, he put the first point, the first step on that way. However, Unfortunately, with increasing experience regarding the biliary atresia, the pediatric surgeon showed or realized that most cases 
have already fibrosed or solid extrahepatic biliary tree and therefore most cases are uncorrectable. Number two, it was not possible in the majority of cases to identify any bile containing structure or extrahepatic duct to make any kind of anastomosis of the conventional biliary anastomosis. So there are no way to make anastomosis between extrahepatic biliary system, this obstructed or thread-like duct with the bowel. So what William Ladd performed in 1928 is not the case, is not similar because most cases showing no any or uh, undilated part to make any kind of biliary anastomosis. After that, in 1950 and 1960, Professor Morio Kasai from Japan start to think that we can make an anastomosis with the porta hepatis. They consider that the remnant of the bile duct, this solid remnant, may contain microscopic duct that connected with intrahepatic bile duct system. So they suppose that if we can expose these ducts at the porta hepatis and make anastomosis with the porta hepatis using bowel loop, we can drain bile. So this Professor Morio Kasai in Sendai, Japan, developed this much radical, unlike William Lant, who used conventional biliary anastomosis between extrahepatic duct dilated part with the bowel. Morio Kasai go beyond this, go to the porta hepatis and start to dissect at the porta hepatis and make anastomosis between the porta hepatis or the entrance of the liver into the bowel with the bowel loop. This operation is called porto, regarding porta hepatis, introstomy, anastomosis with the intestine. This porto introstomy letter carry his name and called Kasai, porto introstomy, related to Morio Kasai. Kasai recognized that this apparently solid biliary remnant contained microscopic biliary channels which communicate this solid remnant contain uh, microscopic biliary channels which communicate with intrahepatic biliary duct system. And if enough of these duct could be exposed at the porta hepatis and drained in a raw loop, the bile flow could be restored and jaundice improved. So this innovation by the Morio Kasai at that time is very essential and it changed the way of the surgical treatment of the cases of the biliary atresia and called Kasai, porto entrostomy. Porto means porta hepatis entrostomy, anastomosis between the porta hepatis. What's porta hepatis? It's the site of the liver at the entrance of the bile duct. So bile duct and the vascular supply go through the liver at this blade called portal blade or porta hepatis. If anastomosis could be performed between the porta hepatis and the lobe of the bowel in a row in Y shape, this could restore the bile and improve the joints. In original Kasai porto introstomy, the Kasai the dissection was limited to the area between the bifurcation of the portal plate. He used this small window at the portal plate, about 5 mm in diameter, and make anastomosis using short row loop and with relatively crude anastomosis using 5O surgical cut gut. This is the start or the first procedure performed by the Kasai. So they dissect the porta hepatis. However, he limited between both branches of the portal vein, limited between the vascular pedicle and the porta hepatis, and perform the anastomosis like this using crude anastomosis, short power. However, 
what Kasai performed in the 1950s and 60s, not necessarily what pediatric surgeon would recognize today. Later, the pediatric surgeon tried to think to improve or maximize Kasai Botulinum They tried to increase the area of anastomosis, to widen the dissection of the Borta hepatis, to get more microscopic channels, to get more bile flow. So the pediatric surgeon, after that, trying to maximize Kasai by both surgical ways and medical ways. Surgical options called extended Kasai portoentrostomy and by using medical options called with some preoperative regimen. Let's see. Surgical option to maximize Kasai in contrast to the original Kasai, which limits between both branches of the portal vein. In extended Kasai, the dissection were extended on the left side between the left between the umbilical vein and the left portal vein to what's called rex fossa and on the right side a dissection extended between the branches of the right vascular pedicle what's called innominate fossa so the idea here is to extend the dissection in the portal blood called extended Kasai porto introstomy. Extended means more radical dissection, aiming to wide area of drainage, wide per area reaching about 20 by 10 millimeter can be incorporated in a longer row loop. Unlike original Kasai, only limited to the window between both branches of the portal vein exposing area of about five millimeter. So this extended approach will maximize the benefit from Kasai Borto Introstomy. So to summarize the steps, as we see, this is the incisions, maybe extended or muscle cutting incisions or some surgeon before limited incision. And then the first step of the surgery is to confirm the diagnosis that the case is biliary atresia not other pathology, by inspection, no bile or only clear mucus in the gallbladder, or in some cases we need to perform operative cholangiogram. It's very important that the operative cholangiogram, no distal, no proximal flow to intrahepatic duct or detection of other anomalies by inspection, polysplenia, situs, deviations of the bowel, a change in the marotations with or without marotation, any other congenital anomalies were helpful in the diagnosis of biliary atresia. Uh, regarding mobilization of the liver, yes, may be done by dividing of the falciform and triangular ligament and deliver and divert the liver into the, ward, into the wound. However, some pediatric surgeon work with the liver inside the abdomen. But there is sling the vascular pedicle, maybe kinking over the IVC and the doctor of anesthesia should be informed about this maneuver to avoid decrease in the venous return. Borta hepatis. This is a very important modification performed for the extended Kasai. The Borta hepatis, the section is extended on the left side between the left the umbilical vein and the left portal vein. Sometimes segment of the liver tissue or bridge may be divided uh, to uh, allow for this dissection and on the right side to the innominate fossa between the branches of the right vascular pedicle. Very important illustration to understand the maximization of the Kasai Borto introstomy. Also the design of the row and configuration of the row loop of the bowel loop. It should be short, not allowing redundancy here to avoid the stasis it should be approximated to the native rectum uh, for about 8 cm proximal to streamline the flow and decrease the incidence of the reflux and stasis. Introstomy here for the anastomosis between the bowel loop and the porta hepatis should be made with the scalpel, not the diacermy to avoid fibrosis and the injury. And also the loop should be passed through retrocolic, passed behind the colon. 
through the retrocolic to allow to reach the bolt hepatis without tension. This is the modification for the design and the configuration of the row loop. And finally, porto introstomy ensure that the row loop uh, has adequate length to reach the porta hepatis. Perform the anastomosis with six OBDS, starting with the posterior row first and then completed with the anterior row. This is summarized of the operative step. You can refer to more details in any operative textbook. So, the second arm is a medical option of the of to maximize CASI. The pediatric surgeon, after surgery for CASI portoentrostomy, asking a question, can more be done to improve the chance of success? Can more be done? If there is other options, yes. Pediatric surgeon think to work in four points. Number one, pile drainage. They need to enhance bile secretion and drainage using choleritic agent like corticosteroids. Number two, they trying to prevent and treat possible post-operative cholangitis by using antibiotics. Number three, they try to limit the hepatic fibrosis. Number four, they try to improve nutritional management. So regarding the medical items, it's very important because in some series, failure of Kasai botulinostomy may reported up to 50% of cases. So the pediatric surgeon trying to improve the success of the surgical aspect trying to give some drugs to enhance bile secretions, some drugs or pharmacology to prevent and treat cholangitis, some drugs to limit hepatic fibrosis, and some drugs to hold nutritional management. Let's see. Number one, bile drainage. While the return and the degree of the bile flow is related to the congenital anomaly and corrected only at surgery, there is maybe a rule for what's called choleritic agent, like corticosteroids, like your deoxycholic acids. Both may be used to enhance file flow post-operatively. Corticosteroids, it's used after Kasai portoentrostomy remain controversial. Many pediatric surgeons consider the corticosteroids as a choleritic, what means by choleritic, increase file secretion. Number two, also they consider corticosteroid as a decrease inflammation and scarring at the anastomotic site. So they prescribe corticosteroids for the treatment or both operative regimen or both operative support to the Kasai portoentrostomy. However, there is a debate to use low dose corticosteroids or high dose corticosteroids. There is a debate and we will go through three reports. Davenport report, the North America START report, and the Japanese biliary atresia society report to judge between using low dose corticosteroid and high dose corticosteroid. Low dose versus high dose. The Davenport performed a randomized study using low dose six week course of pre dizimilon starting at two milligram per kg per day in biliary atresia and reported number one significant reduction in the bilirubin level at one month, especially if the Kasai performed it early. Number two, they reported non significant effect on the clearance of jaundice at six months or subsequent native liver survival between comparing between the corticosteroids and placebo. So this regarding the low dose. Then Davenport republished follow-up, including 44 additional patients treated with high dose steroids, starting at 4, 5 mg per kg per day and reported significant difference in the jaundice clearance between the low dose and the high dose, supposing or supporting high dose corticosteroids. Also reported no significant improvement in the native liver survival when comparing to the high dose group to the placebo. 
So the only effect with a high dose Davenport report is on the jaundice clearance. No effect on the native liver survival. The North American steroid uh, in biliary atresia randomized trial reported non-significant improvement in the jaundice clearance at six months after CASI between the steroids and placebo group. Also, they reported serious and earlier side effect in the steroid group compared with control group. Finally, Japanese Biliary Atresia Society conducted a multi-center randomized trial comparing high dose with the low dose steroids and found that bilirubin was significantly lower in the high dose group at post one and two months post-operatively. Although long-term outcome were not reported in this study. So, the second one after corticosteroids is your sodioxycholic acid. Your sodioxycholic acid is well known and used in the adult cholestatic diseases, primary sclerosing cholangitis, and found very helpful as it choleric decreased inflammation and protect the cholangiocyte. So it's widely thought to be beneficial in the biliary atresia, but only if the surgery has already restored the bile field. Uh, your sodioxycholic acid will enrich bile, has a choleric effect, increase the bile flow, increase the hepatic clearance of the toxic bile acid, also have a cytoprotective effect on the hepatocyte. Studies assessed the effect of the your sodioxycholic acid uh, dosing 25 mg per kg uh, on the liver function in children one year post CASI by what's called discontinuation reintroduction. What means that? That uh, the children is already on the also the oxycholic acid. So uh, we will discontinue the use and observe the child for the side effect and then reintroduce. So this is called discontinuation reintroduction fashion. Uh, 16 children with biliary atresia all cleared their jaundice six months after stopping of the also the oxycholic acid treatment. One child of the sixteen deteriorated worse clinically with recurrence of jaundice, and all but two show significant worsening of the liver enzymes, indicating that your succolic acid is beneficial. And on readmission of the also the oxycholic acid, the biochemistry of these children involved. So they suppose that it may have an effect on the clearance of the jaundice on uh, liver uh, keeping the uh, preserving the liver enzymes. Number two, the second items after bile drainage is a prevention and treatment of cholangitis. Cholangitis is a serious post-operative complication. May occur with restoration of the bile flow, typically in the first two years post cassai The early use of the potent intravenous antibiotics against the gram-negative until the CRP decreasing or leukocytosis resolved remain the first line treatment, no debate. However, the debate is about to use a prophylactic regimen or not. Some center prescribed prophylactic regimen according to the surgeon preference, and the other center don't prescribe anything. So the debate about to use a prophylactic regimen or not. However, in case of cholangitis, the use of intravenous antibiotics, broad spectrum, no debate about this. Limitation of the hepatic fibrosis. Unlike other cholestatic disease, the biliary atresia characterized by progressive liver fibrosis. And as we said that the pathology may be related to intra and extra, maybe early cirrhosis, early need for liver transplantation. So many centers in the China and the West trying to reduce this hepatic fibrosis by using Chinese herbal called Inchin Koto. Inchin koto to infant post kasai giving this ancient koto or Chinese herbal, they suppose that this herbal inhibit apoptosis and decrease the liver fibrosis. However, real evidence for the benefit remain unpublished. So to limit the hepatic fibrosis, many centers 
around the world use the Chinese herbal in Shin Koto. Nutritional management, no doubt that the biliary atresia infant nutritionally compromised with deficiency in the protein, low muscle and liver storage of the glycogen, deficiencies in the fat soluble vitamins, no bile, uh, and if cirrhotic, low serum and the storage level of zinc and selenium. So care must maximize the nutritional potential to maintain the growth and development. With formula, higher triglyceride level and regular parenteral vitamin supplementation, overnight nasogastric feeding to maintain effective calories and protein intake, which is critical in the failing liver, listed for the transplantation, as the outcome is directly related to the nutritional status. It's very important. Uh, to summarize, we have an original CASI, extended CASI or modification, and then maximization. Maximization is very important by the surgery and the medical option. Regarding minimally invasive CASI, is it possible to perform CASI portoentrostomy laparoscopically? Yes, there is a report from Brazil in 2002. However, after that, there are few other reports describing the use of laparoscopy, maybe related to technical difficulty in the small infant, maybe related to increased post-operative complication, maybe related to the compromised liver perfusion from the nemoperitoneum, maybe related to high intra-abdominal pressure, decrease the proliferation and induce apoptosis of the hepatocyte in the rat model. So these items may decrease the use of laparoscopy. However, the item is debatable. There is a studies comparing the laparoscopic and open CASI found that survival after 24 months was worse in the laparoscopic group. In the other studies describing no benefit from the using laparoscopy over the open CASI bortoentrostomy. Uh, moreover, meta-analysis of the outcome of the lab uh, concluding that based on the native liver and the patient survival, lab CASI should not be performed for biliary atresia. This is one arm of the problem. So one arm, uh, don't recommend using laparoscopic CASI bortoentrostomy and prefer to perform the surgery open. However, on the other hand, uh, Shani Tal found that the outcome after lab were relatively good, with a mean of 72 months, with 50% of the patient being jaundice free with normal bilirubin level. Also at Jintendo University in Japan, there is performing minimal invasive CASI with gaining support and began to performing laparoscopic CASI bortoentrostomy from 2009. And they reported that 22 biliary atresia patients underwent laparoscopic CASI between the 2009 and 2016 with a good midterm outcome. They reported post-operative jaundice clearance was 77.3 at 3 months and 90.9 .9 at 6 months. And also the survival with native liver was over 90 at six months and 77 at one year, 73 at two years. So this is the second arm. The second arm supporting the use of the minimally invasive. Moreover, as other study reports support for the minimally invasive CASI and conclude that if experienced pediatric laparoscopic surgeon is present, he should consider uh, laparoscopic CASI bortoentrostomy in babies with biliary atresia. So there is a debate whether to perform the surgery open or laparoscopic. Schools support the open and other schools support laparoscopic CASI procedure. Redo bortoentrostomy. Redo bortoentrostomy. We said that the treatment of the biliary atresia may be CASI bortoentrostomy at the bridge for the transplantation with debate about the native liver preservation. However, is there a rule of the redo bortoentrostomy? 
or the second option will be liver transplantation. What's redo? Redo depend on the bile drainage at the previous operation. So the bile drainage after redo may be expected only in the patient who had a good bile excretion initially. And therefore, the redo CASI should be considered only for selected patient. Good bile flow that suddenly stop, patient who might benefit from delay in transplantation. Otherwise, the treatment for failure of CASI is liver transplantation, not redo. So the redo, trans, redo portoenterostomy is limited to specific indication. Laparoscopic redo has recently described and may be associated with fewer adhesions and the open, thus posing fewer problems at the time of liver transplantation. But the important issue is still present is the indication for redo versus the indication for liver transplantation. Perform redo or perform liver transplantation. This important issue is still the debatable one and we should depends on the uh, items we sent. To summarize, management of the biliary atresia currently almost entirely surgical. Surgical treatment. History of the startment of the surgical treatment dated back to the 1928 with William Ladd. William Ladd described a series of 11 cases of the surgical jaundice that he had operated upon. And his results were remarkable with six out of the 11 cases draining by. Also, not all his cases were truly biliary atresia. Maybe insufficient bile syndrome, maybe colidocal malformations. However, William Kasai put the first step in the way for the tr surgical treatment of such infant. Number two, at the 1950 and 1960, Professor Mario Kasai from Sendai, Japan, performed a more radical approach. The section into the porta hepatis and put the submission that if we can expose microscopic duct at the porta hepatis, this microscopic duct and a stomosed to row lobe could be uh, improve the bile drainage and increase the bile drainage and improve the jaundice. So this era of Kasai performing his original portoenterostomy, which carry his name later. However, later, the pediatric surgeon sought to maximize Kasai by both surgical means or surgical option and medical option. Surgical option, yes. Extended Kasai portoenterostomy. At the first or original Kasai, Morio Kasai were lim was limited to the area between both branches of the portal vein. Narrow area, narrow window. However, the pediatric surgeon later to extend the dissection of the portal blade on the left side to the junction between the umbilical and the left portal called Rex fossa. And on the right side between the postvascular pedicle called the innominate fossa, aiming to widen the bare area at the portal blade to increase the bile flow, to expose more microscopic duct, to expose more intrahepatic bile duct. Also, other modifications or other surgical options related to the design and the configuration of the raw loop. By the medical options, yes. Pediatric surgeon said or raised the question, can more be done to improve the post operative result of CASI, enhancing the bile drainage by using corticosteroids or your deoxycholic acid, prevent and treat the cholangitis by intravenous potent antibiotic or to prescribe prophylactic antibiotic is a debatable one to enhance, decrease the hepatic fibrosis using inchinkinto. Inchinkoto 
it is a Chinese herbal supposed that this herbal may decrease apoptosis may decrease liver fibrosis uh, also medical management improving and giving the infant the nutritional deficiency and we speak about the minimally invasive CASI it's very laparoscopic procedure described with success in Brazil in 2002 however few other reports there is a debate to perform lab CASI or to perform open and finally redo bortoentrostomy redo we speak about redo yes however the important issue is still present is there is an indication for redo versus transplantation it's very important and so the redo is limited to the patient who have good bile flow that suddenly stop and also who might benefit from delay in the transplantation. We will speak about now what important item is a post-operative complications. post casi complication, yes. We may show post-operative cholangitis, portal hypertension, hepatopulmonary syndrome, and portopulmonary hypertension, intrahepatic bile lexis, hepatic malignancy, other complications. Post-operative cholangitis, yes. The anastomosis or the link between the bowel and the porta hepatis, this direct anastomosis may predispose to ascending cholangitis in about 60% of cases. Cholangitis is much common in biliary atresia compared with congenital cholidocal cyst. Why? As the same reconstruction is done, However, uh, the pile drainage, pile drainage in the cholidocal cyst is, or pile flow is so much better than even the beast cassai portoentrostomy. So even in the beast cassai, there is a small duct. There is a limitation of the bile flow. There is colonization of the conduit with bacteria. So this may explain the high incidence of cholangitis. Cholangitis, very common in the first two years, about 40% of infants, and there is decrease after that. The reason for the decline is not, un is, uh, is not known. Uh, it may be time-dependent change in the local immunological defense. There is time change in the immunological defense. Cholangitis, usually defined as elevated serum bilirubin, leukocytosis, a change from the normal uh, to pale or a colic stool in a febrile patient. The treatment is essential and necessary to prevent progressive liver damage with protospectrum intravenous antibiotic with good gram-negative coverage, also prophylactic may be prescribed uh, orally. Number two, pulses of the corticosteroids may be indicated in some cases. Don't forget the late onset cholangitis even with long survival, may precipitate the liver failure and necessitate emergency liver transplantation, which can be fatal. This may be fatal late onset cholangitis. Uh, to decrease the risk of the cholangitis, some pediatric surgeon propose some modification in the raw loop. Open the loop to the skin as a stoma, creation of the valves within the loop, perform conduit between the gallbladder and the porta hepatis called a bortu cholecystostomy or using prophylactic long-term antibiotics to reduce the recurrence of cholangitis, but evidence remains scant. These modifications usually not preferred and return to the long, showing no benefit to the standard long uh, row or customized uh, row loop. This to open the lobe as a stoma and refeed the bile again into it, or to create a valve, or to perform gallbladder conduit. Some researchers uh, working on it use the appendix as a conduit. However, this is not used today, and these modifications return it to the normal. And although of the theoretical benefit, no uh, fixed or no sure benefit of using this modification. Portal hypertension. Yes, maybe uh, the second complications after uh, cholangitis is the portal hypertension, which is very common even with good blood flow. The basic inflammatory process is a persistent hepatic fibrosis, 
we say that unlike other cholestatic disease, the biliary atresia is characterized by progressive intrahepatic fibrosis. The clinical manifestation include varices, hypersplenism, and ascites. Portal hypertension over time seems that the complications may to decrease or reduce the frequency and severity of the variceal bleeding may be related to improvement on the hepatic histology or spontaneous portosystemic shunt. Portal hypertension justify non-surgical approach. However, poor hepatic functions or the complications are indication for the surgical or liver transplantation. So it's very important to understand this item. Hepatopulmonary syndrome and portopulmonary hypertension is a complication characterized by cyanosis, dyspnea on exertion, hypoxia and finger clubbing uh, with diffuse intrapulmonary shunting. Suppose that there is some material passing the liver without being deactivated from the mesenteric circulation and appear to be prevalent in syndromatic biliary atresia. Uh, Portopulmonary hypertension is uncommon complication, can be developed in the long-term survivor after bortoentrostomy if the hepatopulmonary or bortopulmonary hypertension are suspected, therapy consider liver transplantation should be start encouraged and uh, become earlier because symptoms may worse, which may prevent the option of transplantation. Intrahepatic biliary cyst or leak like this, this can be developed at any time after the Kasai bortoentrostomy, may be a source for recurring cholangitis, may be treated with percutaneous drainage and usually the patient become an ectric and the cyst may disappear. Prolonged antibiotics and ursodeoxycholic acid may prevent cholangitis. Persistent refractory infection is indication for liver transplantation, intrahepatic biliary cyst or legs. Hepatic malignancy, very rare. Malignancy change like hepatocellular carcinoma or cholangic carcinoma may complicate the long-term biliary cirrhosis. And we have published a case uh, of hepatocellular cancer reported in 19-year-old post kasai male patient indicating the need for high index of suspicion for the development of carcinoma even in the young patient. Other complications may be metabolic, vitamins, proteins, trace mineral deficiencies. Also the weight gain may be retarded if the hepatic dysfunction persists. Essential fatty acid deficiencies and rickets may occur. So long-term monitoring of the growth and development are recommended in all cases of biliary atresia. Uh, ectopic intestinal variceal bleeding and pulmonary arteriovenous fistula, sometimes seen in the long-term survival. Also, the issue of, of, uh, issue of pregnancy in female. In both the surgical non-transplant biliary atresia patient, preterm caesarean suction at 34 weeks. Gestation is reasonable as a poor hepatic reserve defined the pregnancy as a high risk. However, delivery at full term may be possible for selected mothers with good liver function. To summarize, regarding the post-operative complications of Kasai Borto Entrostomy, number one, post-operative cholangitis, hypoglobin, leukocytosis, uh, acolic stool, fever, portal hypertension, common in infant, even in infant with good bile flow related to the persistent hepatic fibrosis, even after successful portal, successful Kasai bortoentrostomy. Hepatopulmonary syndrome, cyanosis, dyspnea, hypoxia, finger clubbing, common in syndromatic biliary atresia may be due to some uh, mesenteric materials passing the liver without being deactivated and going to the lung. Intrahepatic uh, bile leak or cyst can develop at any time cause recurrent attacks of cholangitis need to be treated antibiotics your acid aspirated or at the end may require liver transplantation hepatic malignancy very rare malignant tumors complicate although in the literature there is one case reported other complications may be metabolic problems related to 
element deficiency may be weight gain uh, problem due to essential fatty acid deficiency. So this slide is very important to summarize the post-operative complication of KSI post-bortoendrosty. Uh, we will speak about shortly about the prognosis of KSI. Without question, KSI bortoendrostomy improved the outcome of infant with biliary atresia. The surgery or the result of the surgical treatment improved steadily over the past 30 years. The major determinant of this factory outcome, number one, the age at the initial operation. Number two, successful post-operative bile flow, present of the microscopic ductal structure at the porta hepatis, extent of the liver disease at diagnosis, and the technical factor involving the anastomosis, the surgeon experience. The age is very important. Single most important factor, favorable outcome suspected if the Kasai performed before 60 days of age, because the cirrhosis were usually developed by three to four months of age. Worse outcome, if the baby older than 100 days at the time of the Kasai because of the obliterative cholangiopathy and the hepatic fibrosis, likely to be developed. However, there is wide discrepancy about the role of the age. A study from the Japan found excellent post-operative outcome with more than 70% 10-year survival if the Kasai performed before 60 days of age. However, there is a survey of the surgical section of the American Academy of the Pediatric in the USA found that the long-term survival was only 25%. Impact of the, on the, of the age on the CASI on long-term survival in type 3 biliary atresia, type 3 obliterated all, type, all extrahepatic pile duct, found significant impact on jaundice clearance but not on the long-term survival, suggests that it may be less important as a prognostic factor over time. Number two, high percent of the patient achieved good bile flow with normal post-operative bilirubin level despite CASI performed after the age of 60 days with no suggestion of poor outcome. So there is a debate about the role of the age as a prognostic factor. Uh, presence of the microscopic ductal structure at the porta hepatis in the biliary atresia, where is a duct at the liver hilum present or obliterated, doesn't seem to be indicative of the prognosis. Some patients with microscopic duct have a good outcome, while others with a larger duct may have a poor outcome. Type 1 and type 2 biliary atresia generally have a good prognosis if treated early, type 1 and type 2. In type 3, obstruction of all extrahepatic, present of larger bile duct at the porta hepatis associated with bitter prognosis. Infant with syndromatic biliary atresia have a worse outcome in the term of clearance of jaundice and survival, survival related to the associated anomalies or malformations particularly congenital heart disease. Evolving hepatopulmonary syndrome is very common in the syndromatic biliary atresia, possible immune compromise from functional uh, hypospelinism. All these items may contribute to the poor outcome associated with syndromatic biliary atresia. Technical factor involving CASI portoendrostomy, we mean the surgeon experience at the performing the anastomosis, uh, it's very important and British survey showing that the patient who treated with CASI bortoendrostomy at center performing one case per year had significantly worse outcome than patient who treated at the center performing more than five case per year. And in many countries, the management of the biliary atresia has been centralized to the center that offer both CASI bortoendrostomy and liver transplantation. Finally, we will speak about the liver transplantation. Biliary atresia is one of the leading indications of liver transplantation all over the world. The indication following CASI are the lack of the bile drainage, signs of the developmental retardation, presence of socially unacceptable complication or side effect. 
The high hepatic artery resistant index measured on the Doppler ultrasound is an indication for relatively urgent transplantation. Also, deterioration in the hepatic status may be precipitated by the adolescent or pregnancy. However, less than 10% of the patient undergoing CASI will remain jaundice free and reach adulthood with good liver function. Uh, the dramatic improvement in the era of using uh, immunosuppression after liver transplantation raised again the question of the transplantation becoming more conventional line of treatment of the biliary atresia. Donor supply is still a problem, however, it reduced to some extent by the reduced size liver transplantation, split liver grafting, and living related liver transplantation. So improvement in this immunosuppressive medication raised the question why liver transplantation is not becoming more conventional for the treatment of biliary atresia. The five-year survival after liver transplantation for biliary atresia is currently about 80 to 90 percent. Long-term survival studies of the post-transplant patient have shown that survival have accepted to good quality of life. The primary transplantation for biliary atresia have been reported with excellent result, but performed rarely. Most centers perform CASI at first, bortoentrostomy. Incidence varies for the primary liver transplantation between Japan, United Kingdom, France, Canada, and Germany. Um, the treatment dilemma exists about one third of the infant with biliary atresia who get no benefit from CASI bortoentrostomy. If this patient could be identified with a specific uh, multidiscrepancy protocols, they could be prepared directly for primary liver transplantation without having more traditional surgical intervention. So, biliary atresia is a very important topic for all pediatric surgeon and pediatrician. What is biliary atresia? It's a fibro-inflammatory disorder affecting both intra- and extra-hepatic bile duct system. The cause is unknown. It may be developmental or intrauterine problem. It may be related to autoimmune disease, viral infections, exposure to toxins. So it's not a single entity disease. Classification. There is a clinical classification. Syndromatic biliary atresia, coexistence of the biliary atresia with other anomalies. Polysplenia, absent spleen, situs inversus, malrotation, congenital heart disease, or cystic biliary atresia, cyst dilatation at the site of the obstructed bile duct. Maybe confused with congenital cholidocal cyst. Or maybe Cytomegaloviral biliary atresia detected immunoglobulin positive in this infant. Maybe isolated, unclassified, unspecified. And unfortunately, this is the largest clinical group. And then morphological classification. Depend on the site of the obstruction, type 1, obstruction of the common bile duct, type 2 common hepatic duct, and type 3, all obstructed extrahepatic bile duct. Correctable and uncorrectable is previously used classification. How to diagnose? We speak about the prenatal diagnosis. Some studies about the use of amniotic fluid digestive enzymes, gamma glutamine transport transportase secreted by the biliary epithelium, pass into the fetal intestine and then pass into the amniotic fluid with second trimester rise, suddenly drop in the third trimester. In cases suggested to have a biliary atresia, the second trimester rise doesn't happen. Associated with non-visualization of the gold bladder by ultrasound may lead to high index of suspicion of biliary atresia. However, the problem is it's difficult to differentiate between abnormally low enzymes and physiologically low. Post-natal post diagnosis, yes, screening of the biliary atresia. Used in Japan, Taiwan, stool color card, and also fractionated hemoglobin at two stages at 60 hours after birth and 
uh, two weeks to screen infant for biliary atresia. Then we speak about the use of the imaging hepatobiliary ultrasound, triangular cord sign, thickening at the portal hepatis, indicating the duct remnant. Hepatobiliary scintigraphy, the tracer will be taken by the liver very rapid, but not executed into the bowel due to obstruction by the biliary atresia and also liver biopsy. It's very accurate and diagnostic. Large duct obstruction, portal tract edema, portal blogging, small cell infiltrate. So this is how to diagnose and how to treat. The story of the treatment starts in 1928 by the William Ladd who treats some cases of surgical jaundice. Suppose they are biliary atresia. However, many of these cases were maybe related to insufficient bile syndrome, maybe related to colidocal malformation. His results were remarkable in restoration of the bile flow. However, whatever he doing, he put the first step on the way of the surgical approach to such infant. After that, pediatric surgeon realized that all biliary atresia cases don't, doesn't have extra hepatic bait and duct to allow anastomosis. After that, in 1950 and 60, Professor Mario Kasai from Sendai in Japan proposed the radical approach to anastomose the portal blade or the portal hepatis with a rope bowel loop, and they suppose that there are a duct in this solid biliary remnant and this duct could have a communication with intrahepatic bile duct system if there is uh, more duct exposed and anastomosis to the bowel the bile flow will restored and the jaundice improved however what Morio Kasai performed in the original technique is not necessarily what pediatric surgeons know today there is what's called maximization of the Kasai board to introstomy. Pediatric surgeons start to maximize the Kasai to get more benefit using surgical option or medical option. Surgical extended Kasai board to introstomy. The pediatric surgeon later dissect more into the portal blade on the left side to reach the junction between the left the umbilical and the left portal vein. And on the right, this is called the Rix fossa, and on the right, between the branches of the right vascular pedicle in nominate fossa. Uh, also, medical improvement. The pediatric surgeon always raised the question can more be done to improve success? Bile drainage may be helped with corticosteroids, whether high or low dose, according to the debate. They also the oxycholic acid. Number two, to prevent anticholangitis with antibiotics. Number three, to use uh, Chinese herbal to limit the fibrosis in Shin Koto, and number four, to improve the nutritional support. And we speak about also the post operative complication of Kasai, cholangitis, hepatopulmonary fibrosis, and also some complications related to the metabolic and the weight disturbance and the weight growth. Uh, and all of these problems should be addressed and known well by the pediatric surgeon. And we speak about the prognosis and we said that the most important is the age. However, there is a debate at the age of the board to introstomy. And finally, we speak about the liver transplantation, the indication for liver transplantation, and the biliary atresia is a leading cause for uh, liver transplantation. And we speak about primary liver transplantation may be suitable for a considerable group, about one third of cases, who not get any benefit from Kasai Bortol Trust. Thank you very much for your watching. Uh, I hope this item and this presentation will be helpful for all pediatric surgeons and pediatrician dealing with the children. Thank you very much and see you next in next subject of pediatric surgery made easy. Thank you.